Hey guys, more Blakey here and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be showing you how we can create some simple enemy AI that will shoot the player. I'll also be showing you how we can only shoot the player when they are within a certain radius to the enemy, as well as how we could use bullets to take away health from the player. So let's get started. In this scene, as you can see, I have a player, a background image, a main camera, an enemy that I made for our project last year. You can use any enemy sprite you want. I have a grid, which includes this tile map ground object. And then I have a canvas, which is just a very simple health bar that is attached to a player health script on my player. You can find a tutorial for this on my channel, but it's not entirely necessary for this video. What I also have is a sprite for a bullet. These are the settings I have attached to it because I'm using pixel art. I've set my filter mode to point no filter and I have no compression. To ensure it is nice and crisp. And if I was to drag this bullet into our scene here and I focused on it, you can see it is just a little spike that is going to come out of this object here. Again, feel free to use any sprite you want that fits your game. So there's a few things we need to do as always in the editor before we go and make any scripts one of those things is we have to turn our bullet sprite into a game object so we can access it from scripts spawn that bullet in and then change values on this bullet to make it go towards the player so what i'm going to do is grab my little sprite here drag it into the scene view you can see it's a little bit further away don't worry about that it doesn't matter i've got it labeled as spike bullet what i'm going to do on this i'm going to add a component i'm going to give it a rigid body because i'm going to be moving this bullet via a rigid body i'm going to set the gravity scale to zero i'm going to set the collision detection mode to continuous and our interpolate mode to interpolate i'm then going to take this bullet here i'm going to drag it into our assets folder and that will make it a prefab. We can then delete the bullet from our hierarchy and it remains as a prefab in the asset folder. With that out of the way, let's go to our spike enemy object and let's add a component. I'm going to type in enemy shooting. I'm going to press new script, create an add, and let's open this up in Visual Studio. So the goal of this script is to simply spawn in the bullet. We're going to make a script later on in the video on our bullet. That's going to handle how that game object moves towards the player. But for this script, we're just going to instantiate it into the scene. So what we're going to do, I'm going to create a public reference to our bullet. So I'm going to do public game object bullet. And then I'm going to do public transform bullet position. So bullet pause. And then we're going to create a private float and call this timer. We're going to use this to control the frequency that the bullets spawn into the scene. In our update function, let's set timer plus equals to time dot delta time. This just means our timer float will go up in seconds. And then we can check if timer is bigger than two. So if two seconds have passed, let's firstly set timer back to zero. So this will reset and this statement will run true every two seconds. And then after that, let's just do shoot, open and close bracket. And you can see we're going to get an error here because we haven't actually created this function yet. That's what we're going to do next. So let's go down and type in void shoot open and close bracket and then in this function all we're going to do is instantiate our bullet game object for the position we're going to do bullet position bullet pause dot position so we're accessing the position of the transform and then for the rotation we can just set that to quaternion dot identity because we're going to be controlling the rotation in a separate script back in our editor let's go on to our enemy and you can see we have two variables now we have bullet game object which we can drag in our prefab here spike bullet and then we have a bullet position and this is where i'm going to create a position for our bullets to spawn at now this is going to vary depending on the game you're making for me i'm going to have it spawn on the inside of my object right in the center and then have it fly out depending on where the player is but if in your game your enemy has a gun you can create a transform in the way we're about to and just have it at the end of the gun so what i'm going to do go to spiker you can see i created a placeholder one here but to show you how to do so i'm going to delete this one now i'm going to go to our spiker right click just press create empty and type in bullet position for the name and for me this works absolutely fine because it is zeroed out right at the center of our object if the end of your gun was this position for example you could just put your transform right here and this would be where your bullets spawn at so now we can go back to our spiker and drag our bullet position game object into our bullet pause slot here and now if we was to press play you can see that every two seconds we have a bullet spawn in now on my game like i said you can't actually see it because they are spawning behind our spiker but i could select one of them and drag them out and you can see they spawn right in. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna create a script on our bullet prefab. So let's open up our prefab. Let's type in enemy bullet script. In this enemy bullet script, I'm gonna create a reference to our player. So I'm gonna do public game object player. We're gonna use the player's position to create a direction that the bullet can go towards and rotate towards. I'm also gonna make a reference to our rigid body. So let's do private rigid body 2D, call it RB. Then in our start function, let's just do RB equals get component rigid body 2D. I can also set our player game object to private as well because we can reference this in the start function. So we can do player is equal to game object with a capital G dot find game object with a tag 
then the tag we're going to use is player with a capital P. If you haven't already set up tags, don't worry because we're going to do it back in the editor. So now in the stub function, what we can do is underneath this, let's create a direction for the bullet to go in. So we can just call this direction and then we can set this equal to the player.transform.position minus the position of the bullet. This will create a direction directly towards the player. And from this, let's then set the velocity of this bullet. So rb.velocity. So we're referencing our rigid body here and then we can do equals new vector two. So a new vector two is looking for X and Y parameters. So we can just do direction dot x and direction dot y then we can normalize this to ensure the direction stays the same but we set the length to one and then finally we can multiply this by a new variable we're going to create and i'm just going to call this public float force and then we can just multiply this by force add a semicolon so the reason we multiply it by force this just means we can control the speed of our bullet in the editor so now back in the editor let's go to our player if you haven't already done this go to the tags at the top and add a player tag if you don't have this player tag go to add tag press the plus sign, type in player, go back to your player and then add that tag. Then let's go to our spike bullet prefab and set the force to something like five, save this. And now we can press play and test this out. And you can see every two seconds, we have a bullet that will fly towards our player. No matter the position, it will try and go to the current position the player was when the bullet spawns in. It will not update every frame, which is exactly what we want. It is not in the rotation that we want it. So that is what we're gonna add next. So now back in our script, I'm gonna create a new float and call it rot for rotation. And then we're gonna set this to a function known as mathf.atan2. This is gonna give us an angle in radians that we're then gonna convert into degrees. We can pass these degrees in a quaternion, which we will then use to set the rotation of our transform. It's a little bit confusing to explain if you're not very math orientated, but it's one of those things that will get easier as you use it more and more often. So inside these brackets, we're gonna be using the opposite of direction. So we're gonna do minus direction.y and then minus direction.x. And this may look confusing as it is contradicting the X and Y parameters we've used here. But if we hover over this ATAN2 text here, you can see it's actually looking for a float Y and a float X in this order. So that is one important thing to note. And then with this, we are just going to multiply this by mathf.radians2 degrees, which is a neat little function that we can use to convert this into degrees. And finally, we're going to access the rotation of our transform by doing transform.rotation. And then we can use quaternion.eula, which returns a rotation that rotates z degrees around the z axes. And the same for the x and y, which is why we use radians2 degrees conversion. So for the x and y, because we're in a 2D game, we don't want to change those. So we can just do 0, 0. But then for Z, this is where we can pass in our rot float. And you can see this alone might look a little bit off depending on the orientation of your sprite. But I'm going to show you how we're going to be able to tweak this so it looks right every single time. But for now, this should be enough that we can test if the rotation does change depending on the position of the player. So you can see right now, it may not look any different. But if I jump, you can see that it is actually rotating. But like I mentioned, it is off by a certain number of degrees. But we can very easily change this in our script to ensure that it looks right every single time. So right now I have the game paused. You can see the bullet has come from my enemy and gone this way. So I'm gonna select this bullet right here and we want it to rotate like this towards the player. So if we look in the top right here to do that, we need to add 90 degrees on the Z axis. So that means in our script, in our Z axis here, we can just add 90 on top of that. So we're adding 90 degrees on top of the current degrees. So now if we test this again, you can see it is now rotating correctly and I can jump and you can see even then it rotates in the way it should. I can show this even better by just making our enemy float for a sec. And you can see wherever I move, it will move towards our bullet and also rotate towards it as well. So now, as you can see, we've successfully got an enemy shooting towards our player. But we're going to take this a step further and show that if we were to walk outside of a certain range from our enemy, the enemy would not shoot. But then we enter that range and the enemy starts shooting again. To round off this video, I'm also going to show you how these bullets could affect this health bar that we have at the top here. So back in our enemy shooting script, it's not the bullet script, but it is in fact the enemy shooting script. So what I'm going to do here is create a new float. So I'm just going to do float distance and I'm going to set this to vector two dot distance. Then inside this, we're just going to start off with the current transform dot position. And then the other position we are going to use is going to be the player. So let's go to the top here, use private game object player. And then in our start function, do what we did in the other script and do player is equal to game object dot find game object with tag player with a capital P. So now we can do player.transform.position. So what this line of code means is that as it's in our update function, every frame, this float will represent the distance between the enemy and the player. And we can use this to detect when we want our enemy to shoot. So now we can do a new if statement and do if distance is smaller than 10, firstly, we can put this line of code timer plus equals time to delta time inside these curly brackets, remove it from here, 
And then also this if statement we've got right here, let's put that inside this statement as well underneath the timer plus equals time to delta time. We can then also remove this from here. Finally, underneath this, let's just add a debug.log and just use distance with a semicolon at the end, just so we know in the editor, the distance at all times. Before we go back into the editor, I'm actually gonna make this value just a little bit smaller, change it to something like four, and now if we press play here, you can see in the bottom left, we have the distance between the player and the enemy. And as we move, this value changes because we have a distance of less than four between us. You can see the enemy shoots. But if we move outside of this range, the enemy will no longer shoot. But when we move back inside this range, the enemy will shoot again, which is exactly what we want. So what we're going to do next is we're going to add the logic to ensure that our bullet does not remain in the scene forever. So to do that, let's go onto our bullet prefab. Let's add a box collider 2D and let's set it to is trigger. Now in our enemy bullet script, what we can initially do is create a private float, call it timer, similar to how we did in the other script. Let's do timer plus equals time dot delta time. And then from there, we can simply do if timer is bigger than 10, destroy it game object. So if this bullet has been in the scene for longer than 10 seconds, the bullet will then be destroyed. Now you could up this to something like 20 or any number that you feel works for your game. But now what I'm also gonna do is ensure this bullet is destroyed if it collides with our player. So I'm gonna do this using void on trigger enter 2D, change the collision to other, and we can get rid of the private here. Now make sure that this is outside of your update function and outside of your start function. I've seen some of you guys in the comments having issues with your code and occasionally it has been the case where your trigger or collision functions have been inside your update and that will absolutely not work. So from here we can do if other dot game object dot compare tag is equal to player. So if we collide with our player we can simply do destroy game object. And now we can test this out and you can see when the bullet hits the player it does indeed disappear. It does disappear quite early but that is simply down to the bounds of my player. You can see they are quite wide and do have some room here. So the minute it hits this bound it will be destroyed. Of course feel free to alter this for your game. Now to wrap this video up, I'm gonna show you how we could take away from the player health if the bullet collides with the player. And what's handy is that we already have this function here, which can check if we are colliding with the player. So before we destroy the game object, what we can do is do other. So we're referencing the game object we've just collided with. So other dot game object. And then we're gonna do get component. And then we can look for player health. And then inside the player health script, there is a float called health. As you can see in our player health script, I have a public float known as health. So I can access that health and I can just do minus equals 20 and then close out with a semicolon. So now I can test this out and you can see at the top, our bar slowly gets smaller. And I can do this all the way until I die in which my player indeed disappears. From here, you could then have a game over screen, which coincidentally I did a tutorial on just last week. So feel free to check that out. But on that note, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. If there's anything I missed or if there's any questions you have, feel free to ask in the comments down below. If you have a tutorial you want to see, feel free to request it in the Google form I have in the description. And finally, if you feel like supporting me or if you want these scripts, feel free to take a look at my Patreon and the tiers within in the description as well. But on that note, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I will thank you all very much for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.